Earlier, you observed the airflow pattern in a convection chamber. Air at one end of the convection chamber was being heated by a candle. Cool, smoke-filled air entered the chamber at the other end and immediately sank to the bottom of the chamber. The cool air moved across the bottom of the chamber and moved under the warmer, less dense air, causing the warm air to rise. The rising warm air had no place to go, so it traveled across the top of the chamber to the other end. Here, the air cooled and sank. The whole cycle repeated, producing a small convection cell. This is a model of what happens in the real world when you have seen that earth materials heat and cool at different rates. You also built a model to show this differential heating creates convection cells and produces wind. Now let's put everything you have learned together and look at differential heating on a global scale. Because of the high solar angle, Earth's surface is always warmer in the tropics, the part of the planet near the equator. Water in the tropical ocean and tropical land masses absorb a lot of solar energy. Air in contact with tropical sea or land receives a lot of energy by radiation and conduction, energy transfer through contact. Huge masses of air heat up and begin to rise. This is the state of the largest convection cell on Earth, one the size of the entire equatorial area. The equatorial convection cells circle the globe like two bicycle inner tubes. Because much of that energy transfer occurs over the ocean, large amounts of water vapor rise high into the atmosphere, riding along in a convection cell. As the warm, moist air rises, it cools. At about 10 kilometers altitude, the warm air has cooled to the same temperature as the surrounding air. The cool air begins to fall back to Earth, but because the wall of warm air is rising from the tropics, it can't return directly. The cool air is still at about 10 kilometers, flows north and south like two gigantic conveyor belts. When it reaches about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, it descends towards the Earth. Meanwhile, the warm, low-density rising air in the tropic creates a low-pressure area. The cooler, more dense air that is descending from the upper atmosphere creates a high-pressure area. The more dense air flows into the area of low pressure to replace the rising air. This creates a huge convection cell called a Hadley cell, named after George Hadley. He was the first to propose the idea of these enormous convection cells in 1735. The bottom of the cell flows across the surface of the planet from about 30 degrees north and south towards the equator, produ equator producing wind. Differential heating creates high and low pressure areas causing wind. Winds always tend to move from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. However, as you saw earlier when you looked at air pressure maps and actual wind data, winds don't blow directly from high pressure area to low pressure areas. Instead, the wind takes a curving path. Why does this happen? As air in the atmosphere moves, Earth rotates, dragging the air along with it and changing its direction. This is called Coriolis effect. The easterly movement of the planet means the winds of the Hadley cell don't go straight north to south. The Coriolis effect causes the wind in the northern hemisphere to curve clockwise and the winds in the southern hemisphere to curve counterclockwise. The combination of high and low pressure areas and the Coriolis effect gives us the prevailing wind direction. Prevailing winds are global winds. They are predictable for different latitudes on Earth. These global winds are not greatly influenced by structures on Earth's surface like forests, cities, and mountains. Prevailing wind direction is important to people sailing ships, flying balloons around the Earth, flying airplanes, and building wind turbine farms to generate electricity. As you will see later, prevailing winds are also an important factor in the local weather. Centuries ago, sailors named different prevailing winds. Between 5 degrees and 25 degrees north or south latitude, there were usually dependable winds that would carry a ship across the ocean quickly. Because ships were crossing the ocean back and forth carrying goods to trade between the Americas and Europe, these winds became known as the trade winds. However, near the equator, the air is rising, and at about 30 degrees north and south latitude, the air is descending. At these latitudes, the wind is usually very light or non-existent. Sailing ships crossing these areas could get stuck for days or weeks. The calm area around the equator became known as doldrums. The windless area around 30 degrees north was known as horse latitudes. This term might have been coined when Europeans were carrying horses across the ocean to the colonies. Ships would sometimes get stuck at about 30 degrees north, making the trip much longer than planned. The sailors would run out of water for the horses, and horses could die. Prevailing winds and the Hadley cells happen at the surface of the Earth. There are winds at upper levels of the atmosphere as well, including the most familiar one called the jet stream. Jet streams are narrow bands of high altitude wind that occur in predictable patterns, but vary over time. Changes to the jet streams can greatly affect weather patterns on the surface of the Earth and even change the flight time on an aircraft. In addition to the Hadley cells, there are two other bands of convection cells in both the North and Southern hemispheres. 
They produce prevailing westerlies between 35 degrees and 55 degrees north and south latitudes. The other, polar easterlies, reside north and south of 60 degrees. Local winds change with the season and even with the time of day. They are the direct result of local differential heating. Local winds are affected by land structures and bodies of water near land masses. A typical Chicago weather forecast in the summer might go something like this. Sunny skies today with a high of 29 degrees Celsius inland, temperatures will be in the low 20s lakeside. The climate of Chicago is affected by being near a large body of water. Land masses near the Great Lakes or the ocean will feel the effects of nearby water. Here's how. From your experiment with the heating of earth materials, you know that land masses get hotter faster than water when the sun shines. The hot land transfers heat to the air above it and the air expands. The warmer, less dense air creates a low pressure area over the land. Even though the sea absorbs energy, its temperature does not change much at all. During the day, the sea stays cooler than the land. Less energy transfers to the air over the water, so it is cool and dense, which means higher air pressure. Air from the high pressure area over the water flows to the area of low pressure. Wind blows from the sea to the land. This is called a sea breeze. Take some time to look at these pictures. The diagrams are going to be really helpful for where we're going in the very, very near future. So legit take a look at them. At sunset, there may be a period of calm when land and sea temperatures are about equal. After sunset, the land cools off quickly. The air over the land cools and contracts, becoming more dense. At this point, the local high pressure area is over the land. Meanwhile, the sea temperature is about the same as it was during the day, so the air pressure is about the same but it is lower than the local pressure of over the land. Now the local high pressure over the land moves into the lower pressure area over the water. Wind blows from the land out to the sea. This is called a land breeze. 